So, did Jesus turn water into wine? And what kind of wine was it? So, this is what we know. Jesus turned water into wine. This was at a wedding in a place called Cana or Kene. Depending on how you want to pronounce it, it is C-A-N-A. This was in Galilee. So this was also recorded as Jesus' first miracle. So basically, the backstory is, him and his disciples, just after he had gathered the disciples together, they were invited to a wedding. I guess his mother and the rest of his family was there. So they ran out of wine and his mother came to him and told him, and then his response was, what does this have to do with me? So which means this wasn't even something he had intended to do. And then his mother told the servants that just do whatever he says. And then at this point, Jesus asked them to fill these six huge jars. These jars were made out of stone and apparently they could take up to 100 liters of water. So these were really big. They were made out of stone. And he told them to fill them up with water. And then after which they did, he didn't pray or, or anything like that. He told them to draw some liquid from these containers and give it to the master. And it turned out to be wine. All right. So that's what we know. And uh, this place, Kana, is a place in Galilee, which today is known as either the southern region of Lebanon or the northern region of Israel. It could be just somewhere around over there, all right? And the people who were drinking the wine at that time were the Jewish people. So wine drinking was part of Jewish culture back in the day, as it is today. So yes, all of this can be found in John 2, verse 10 to 11. So I'll just read it word for word. It says, So after the wine was served and given to the master, in today's terms, I think would be something like an MC or the master of ceremony, someone who was hosting the banquet, so not the bridegroom. So it says over here in Second John verse 10, it says, And he said, Everyone brings out choice wine first and the cheap wine after. He means the cheap wine was usually brought after the guests were already drunk. You know, and then cheap wine was brought, so they couldn't taste whether it was low quality and so forth. So I guess this was something that was happening back in the day. But in this case, the master is telling the bridegroom, but you have saved the best till now. All right, so as we know, the New Testament of the Bible was translated from Greek. So let us look at the words for wine that were used. So in the Greek language, there are two words for wine. One is oinos. The other one is krasi, oino spelled O-I-N-O-S. And the other one, krasi or krasi spelled K-R-S-I. So the first one, oinos, was wine, but it was a more general term for wine and can refer to any kind of wine, red wine, white wine, fermented or unfermented wine. The second term was crassy, also referred to as wine, but specifically mixed wine or wine that has been diluted. All right. So both words can be found in the ancient Greek language, although oinos is much older. So crassy is regarded as the younger word there, you know. So keep in mind, they refer to wine in general, could be red, white, fermented or unfermented. And the second word meant specifically to wine that was diluted with water. So now, is it possible that the wine that Jesus made was unfermented? Let us look into how unfermented wine is made even today. So basically, you take your grapes from the vineyard. You'd crush the grapes with a blender, your feet, some tools, anything that was able to crush uh, the grapes. You'd squeeze out the juice, get rid of the pulp. And if you wanted to consume it in a safe and healthy way, you'd have to treat this juice, you know, basically through a process called pasteurization. So they normally do that even with milk and so forth if you don't want the wine to ferment. So basically you kill the yeast and the bacteria in the wine. So this process was done or, or can be done by heating the milk or the wine or the grape juice. So somewhere around between 75 to about 80 degrees, that's about um, 180 Fahrenheit. And then after you had killed all the bacteria and yeast, you are supposed to immediately cool it down as well. All right. So let's go to the next point over here. Back in the day, I doubt they had the tools for pasteurization 
and cooling or even preserving wine the way we do today. So in order for wine to become alcoholic, it needs time to ferment. You know, after the process of fermentation, that's when the ABV or the alcohol volume goes high and it becomes alcoholic. So in this case, it seemed like they'd run out of wine and Jesus' mother ran to him and said, man, the wine is done. So is it possible that this wine was not fermented wine and hence it was quicker to prepare? That's just one side note to think about. Here's another side note. It was customary for the people of the region in that time to dilute their wine with water for several reasons. Even today in the Talmud, according to Jewish tradition, wine has to be diluted for many reasons. So one of the obvious reasons was hydration. Even today, we do know that drinking alcohol, I'm talking about your vodkas, whiskeys and tequilas and so forth, even coffee, you do get dehydrated because all of these substances act as diuretics, right? So hydration was one of the reasons. Sobriety was another reason. So basically, people wanted to be sober at these events so that they could socialize. Up until today in Jewish tradition, that is practiced as well. The third factor was taste. So back in the day, they would try to preserve that wine using different methods by adding things like resin and so forth. But they never had the equipment we have today. So wine didn't taste as good as it does today. For some people so adding water to it made it more palatable and um, it was easier to drink and have with your food as well and lastly another very logical reason as to why people used to dilute their wine was economy if you're hosting a wedding of up to 600 700 people you know diluting your wine would would ensure that there'd be more wine to go around and in this case if you go back to the book of john uh, chapter 2, it makes a lot of sense because if um, the master of banquets told the groom that most people usually bring their choice wine first and then serve the cheaper wine after. So in this case, it may tell us that these people were maybe drinking alcoholic wine and after they had already drank all of it, Jesus made them non-alcoholic wine, something that was diluted to kind of sober them up firstly and secondly to hydrate them because this is how god works i mean god loves us you know he loves us mind body soul spirit everything you know so he wants us to be healthy and okay as well and it's very interesting that according to the talmud now the talmud is jewish texts and writings that the jewish people live by you know these are basically centuries upon centuries of traditions of uh, Jewish customs, you know. And according to the Talmud, they have different specifications and different ways of diluting their wine and different ratios of the wine to water depending on the event, depending on what's being taken place. If the event is something more ritualistic and uh, religious and so forth, then the wine is diluted in a different way as compared to something like a wedding or any other event, you know. One of the rabbis in the Talmud did say, and mind you, these people did not believe in Jesus as being the Messiah, so it's got nothing to, uh, so it's got nothing to do with the New Testament. But according to the Talmud, diluting wine with, uh, so basically one part wine and six parts water was the best, because this way it ensured that the alcoholic uh, volume in the wine would decrease first of all, so it would go, so it would go somewhere between uh, five to ten percent. This is like a very light, mild beer, like a Corona, basically. And it's interesting to point out the fact that Jesus used six large jars and filled them up with water first. If he wanted to create wine, he could have just put wine in there. But why did he tell them to fill them up with water to the brim? And then the wine came out of there. Also interesting to see that Jesus never prayed for the wine. He never prayed for the water. He didn't touch the jars. So it could mean that the wine did in fact have alcohol, but was diluted by six jars full of water to kind of sober the people up. And this could also mean why Jesus never prayed for it. He never touched it. He himself never drank it as well. So that's just the physical part uh, uh, about what we know. Now, let's look at scripture. What does scripture say? All right. John 15 verse 1 to 5. Jesus refers to himself as the vine. So my thoughts on this. 
could be this was a symbolic way of Jesus saying that we should drink rather from him because he is the vine. And let's go back to scripture. In Isaiah 9 verses 1 to 2, it talks about the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. So Zebulun and Naphtali, these were both the sons of Jacob from which some tribes of Israel derived from. All right. So in this passage in Isaiah, it talks about the people in those lands coming from darkness to light, from distress to comfort, you know, basically from being lost to getting found. So like a new revelation was being found in that land, you know, these people were being exposed to something new, something fresh. And it turns out that where this party was taking place in the land of Cana in, in Galilee is also the same region uh, where the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali were residing in the same place. So could this also be something symbolic where Jesus is saying the previous was darkness, but now I'm here, I'm light, because this was the first miracle of his ministry. This was the first act of his ministry just before he began his ministry. You know what I mean? So could this be another symbolic reference over here? And also because in the party, the master of the party did say that the choice wine was usually given at parties and then the cheaper wine after. But in this case, it looks like the better wine was given after. So could this also mean the same thing from distress to comfort, from darkness to light? You know, the Bible never mentions names or picks places by coincidence. You know, usually you need to look at the cross reference to kind of draw a line, to kind of get a parallel. And this is how you would understand it, you know. And, and of course, this also comes with divine revelation from God himself. But this is after you yourself uh, have already tried to search for it. Anyways, let's move on to the next point. In Matthew 4, verses 12 to 17, it talks about Jesus starting his ministry after John the Baptist was arrested. Is it possible that in the book of John, right after the disciples heard John the Baptist saying, here is the lamb, you know, here is the light. Basically, John was like kind of passing the torch over to Jesus. So in John, it talks about John saying this, and then the next scene we get is Jesus at the party. But in the book of Matthew, it says John was arrested, and the next thing, Jesus began his ministry. So once again, we get another parallel. It's basically the same thing. So basically, I think what God is trying to say is, if you didn't understand what was going on in the book of John with him turning water into wine, go back to the same scene and get it from a different perspective in the book of Matthew, where John the Baptist gets arrested, Jesus starts his miracle. In the book of John, John the Baptist passes the torch to Jesus and he starts his miracle with, I mean, sorry, he starts his ministry with what? Turning water into wine. You see, so from there you can see the parallels, you know. All right. So these are the final notes on this subject over here. For wine to be fully alcoholic, it needs time to mature. So Jesus never gave that uh, wine time to ferment and become alcoholic. So that's one point. So the second point is, Jesus used six large jars. Now we do know in the story of creation, once again, this is just a side note, but man was created on the sixth day. So could that also be an indication that these six jars represent men and this whole thing that was happening with the wine in Cana and the wedding was a lesson and something he was trying to share with us as men and not just alcohol that people were supposed to just drink and so forth and if you look where it says that Jesus refers to himself as the vine he refers to God as the gardener another hint to men being created on the sixth day because who did the gardener who's God who did he put in the garden of Eden, men. Because God created the garden and he put men in the garden, you know. And Jesus, by referring to himself as the vine, he said, as long as you have me in you, you will always produce good fruit. You get what I mean? Uh, last but not least, another thing to show you that this was probably not alcoholic wine, but if it was, it was very, very mild wine. Is Jesus was basically back in the day a Hebrew or Jewish, you know, and this was according to Jewish custom. So he didn't come to create new laws and new rules. He said he just came to fulfill prophecy, you know. So basically he gave Jewish people what they wanted. Everything he did was in line. 
And if you look in the book of uh, Genesis 9, it talks about the story of Noah getting drunk and him cursing his son and grandson and so forth. It shows you that the Bible does not condone drunkenness and drinking. Again, we can go to Genesis 19. We see the story of Lot where he got drunk and he had sexual affairs with his own daughters. Again, the Bible does not condone. Again, we go to the book of 1 Samuel 25. We see the story of David and Abigail or Nabal, where because of his drunkenness, because of the drunkenness of Nabal, he responded to David in a certain way and he ended up dying. Again, we can go to the book of Daniel 5. We see Belshazzar was the king at the time. Because he was drunk, he went on to blaspheme God and died. So the Bible does show us that the fruits of drinking alcohol is sexual immorality, death, blasphemy, all the bad things. You know, so once again, it being the fruits, the fruits that you produce, but the fruits of God, the fruits of the vine, the fruits of Jesus Christ are opposite from that. You know, it's not death, it's not this, it's not that. So at the end of the day, yes, maybe Jesus did turn the water into wine, but if, but if it was wine, I think it was very, very mild, which goes in tradition with, with most Jewish people. And even, let's just say, for argument's sake, if it was normal alcohol, you know, just regular wine, that still doesn't give us the right to become drunk and act senseless because scientifically it has been proven. You can look it up for yourself. Alcohol, I do not care what anyone says, alcohol does not have any benefits. You know, people usually used to say things like a glass of wine every day, just one glass of red wine with dinner is good for your heart and so forth. Well, sorry to burst your bubble, but there has not been any adequate scientific backing up of this uh, theory, you know. So alcohol does not uh, provide any health benefits. Do you know what provides health benefits? Vitamin pills. Uh, water, eating healthy, exercising, and so forth. You know, all the good stuff that nobody wants to do. Anyways, that's just my thoughts on Jesus turning water into wine. Thank you.